Welcome back to another episode of My Corner Universe. Today, we had Tish and Jessica from the freerobwill.org project. And going into this, I knew it was going to be a heavy conversation just because it's about uh, a man's innocence that is on death row currently. And um, these ladies are amazing in the sense that they've taken the baton and helped raise awareness to his case, which is crucial in a case like this um, to really shed light on the darkness. That way, uh, you know, he isn't wrongfully executed since he's already been wrongfully prosecuted. Yeah. And I, I didn't know anything about Rob Will or his case until it came across yeah, likewise. them on Instagram and then just started, you know, learning more and reached out to them and thought they would be good guests. It's totally different than a lot of our other uh, guests that we have, but it just, I still think it's, it's a story that's definitely worth learning more about. I mean, you think of Rob who, you know, after you listen to the podcast and by all means do your own research and, and try and dig in as deep as you can to the story, but it seems like all signs point to a wrongful conviction and that he's an innocent man sitting on death row. He lost already 20 years in the prime of his life, you know, in solitary confinement in jail. Um, and, you know, there is hope, you know, there's been some legal hope that's come for different appeals. So that's really good. Obviously, you know, it's not, you know, it's not the best situation. He's still in, in jail right now, but there is hope. And, um, and just, yeah, just Jess and Tish, Tish just, they just, you know, they know so much about the case. They explain it all so well. Um, and just, I really enjoyed the time talking with them about it. Yeah. It, they bring some great information and really, uh, you know, they kind of alluded to this, but there's so many people right now that are incarcerated that are innocent and, uh, they have no financial gain in this. They are really just giving of their time and their energy to, uh, to help a man that's in prison. You know, it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. It's telling too that, I mean, neither of them knew Rob, right? right. Like, they, like they, like they didn't, well, they, and also they were like family you. members or friends that are fighting. for yeah. him. Like they didn't know him, you know, they just came across a story. And like, I think what you were about to say is that it shows, the validity of his argument that he's innocent is that like people that definitely. Are, you know it definitely that does no connection with them are like hey i'm willing to fight you know spend years of my life and money helping to fight this person you know for him to to get you know acquitted yeah and you know so it'll be uh i'm definitely gonna you know start following the case moving forward it sounds like it probably won't uh you know have any forward momentum until maybe next year but um you know, it'll be interesting to see if this new uh, information that was hidden from the original prosecution is able to, uh, you know, tip the scales in his favor. Yeah. yeah. So, hope you guys enjoy the episode. Um, check out freerobwill.org. Also follow them on social media, Free Rob Will. And um, again, enjoy the episode. Share. Make sure you're uh, subscribing and enjoying these podcasts and share them with people so you can get help get Rob's story out to more. Yeah. Each, each person that shares this, you know, a new set of ears learns about his story. So thanks. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of my corner of the universe. Today we are joined by Jessica and Tish from free org. Thank you ladies very much for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Great. So um, obviously, I think a lot of our listeners might not be familiar with Rob Will um, and what he's going through right now. So instead of having me kind of stumble over what the story is, um, would one of you guys like to take it away, kind of the background of Rob's story and um, more or less where it stands today? So in 2002, uh, Rob was convicted and uh, sent to death row uh, for the murder of a police officer and that comes from a crime in 2000 where Rob and a few of his friends were uh, stripping car parts basically um, all out being naughty boys of an evening when two police officers uh, partners came across them um, 
one officer, Deputy Kelly, chased uh, Rob's co-defendant, Deputy Hill. He was chasing Rob's co-defendant and Deputy Hill was chasing Rob. Um, the last thing obviously we know is Deputy Hill was murdered is the police uh, radio logs and then everybody's different stories. Um, Rob claims he was handcuffed by Deputy Hill and then his co-defendant came along a moment, about a minute later um, and shot uh, Deputy Hill. Uh, yeah, sorry, Deputy Hill. Um, Deputy Kelly witnessed none of it. All of he got, he got was the radio where he'd heard uh, Deputy Hill say, um, I have one in custody. Now, police training records, the way the police works with the training uh, books and, and whatnot, um, they state that in custody means somebody is subdued and handcuffed. That does not mean I've just grabbed him. That means he's in handcuffs, which does go along with what Rob says. And uh, on the crime scene, there are handcuffs on the ground. So that sub story is substantiated. Um, after the, the, the shots go off over the radio, um, basically uh, Rob states that his co-defendant undid his handcuffs and they both fled. Um, from that point, 30 minutes later, more officers come along the scene and Deputy Hill's body is found. So that's the crime scene for you, basically. Gotcha. And then Rob wasn't convicted of a crime until two years later after that? That's just because of the length of time it takes to go to trial in America. Oh, okay. Got it. He was Like, he could have been found innocent. You're going to spend two years in jail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He was arrested um, after that. He was, he was arrested four hours later. Gotcha. So according to Rob, after they had both fled, uh, Rob stole a car and drove uh, four hours uh, four hours later was ar arrested in another town north of Houston um, he was arrested by another police officer he did not put up a fight this is all substantiated at trial he put his hands up and he was immediately arrested with no altercation with the police officer um, according to various witnesses um, who were there at the time the co-defendant then ran to Rob's apartment where there were a number of witnesses um, and he came in, confessed to the crime, took off his clothes, put them in the washing machine. Bloody clothes. <laughs> took off his bloody clothes, put them in the washing machine, bleached them, confessed to the three different witnesses that were there, mm -hmm. then proceeded to take his items that he had with him, put them in Rob's utility closet with a note that said, Rob, here's my stuff, and signed by another friend of theirs to try and frame that friend. Now that stuff that he put in there included the holster for the murder weapon, uh, extra ammo for the murder weapon, along with other items such as bulletproof vests and other unpleasant items. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, so then, so then Rob gets arrested. <clears throat> I'm guessing, you know, there was some sort of, was he even released on bail or did he have to spend the whole time in jail? No, no he was never released to the jail. Sorry, Jess. Yeah, I guess okay. like, probably when it's a you know uh, how, murder of an officer, they usually don't. You know, release yeah, him. was uh, was Rob's co-defendant arrested uh, at a later time? When did he get arrested? Uh, uh, he was uh, he was arrested several days later, um, but he he uh, was never inter interrogated. They allowed uh, until after he was allowed to speak with his police officer father. That was allowed by the police that he could meet with his father before ever being interrogated. His clothing that was handed in was handed in, washed and in a neat pile by his father five five days after the crime. Is he still incarcerated? He was only charged with theft. Theft, okay. Gotcha. So yeah, he's, he's not been, at the moment. He's been incarcerated throughout the years. Um, there's On other we, stuff. Oh, yeah, we saw a recent mugshot of him and then now this uh, video on Facebook that you can watch, um, but not for this. For other gotcha. And so I'm, I'm assuming that if Rob, when he did try and tell this story, it kind of probably fell on deaf ears on the judge or the jurors because they're like, yeah, yeah, it's just your word versus his at this point, right? Right. And I mean, one of the things, one of the things that's really frustrating is that as in a lot of trials, they, they really, 
they, they pick a narrative and they push it on the jurors. Right. And the narrative that they pushed with Rob's was, look how he behaved at half of the crime compared to mm-hmm. the co-defendant, that he, he looked guilty. You know, he ran away. He, he, it's not how an innocent man acts. And then they compared it to how the co-defendant acted. And, ma- and made it look like he acted like an innocent man. But there's mm-hmm. so much evidence that is so much worse from the co-defendant. The co-defendant lied to the police repeatedly. First of all, he said that he didn't know Rob, that he wasn't there. Each of these stories change throughout his questioning um, as he realizes that he's digging himself deeper. Um, he, while in jail, confesses to other inmates. Um, he he makes statements to jail officers. These are actual jail records. These aren't. This isn't just jail snitch uh, testimony. These are these are jail records that he he made incriminating statements to jail officers. Um, he had he attempted to have a hit put on Rob. That's a, that's in a jail record. I mean, you can see that yourself. A hit um, while Rob was in jail. Yeah, mm-hmm. he he oh. he went to another inmate who had who was gang affiliated uh, and asked him to put a hit out on Rob. He, he wanted to have him killed, obviously, so he didn't have to, wouldn't speak about the crime. Now, this right. is, again, a jail record. This is not, this is not hearsay. This, he was, had to be moved to segregation because he was trying to have somebody murdered. Mm-hmm. This so, was actually, that's actually part of the reason why one of his appeals was just granted because they want to hear more about is that, that the, the Brady hit. claim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I want to so, get to that in a minute. But before we jump there, how about we start with how each of you ladies got involved with the free org, And then we can kind of circle back to where we just were with the stories. That way we can kind of get a, a feel for how you were both uh, found out about it and why you decided to take action and help. Sure. So 20, um, I think it was 2011 or 2012. I was, I just finished college a few years before that. And it sounds very cliche. Like I said, um, I was reading a lot of John Gershom books and he released one that was about, it was a fictional story, but it very well now that I know all of this could be real. Um, so after I read that book and it kind of just like shook me, like I never read anything about this before. Um, I started doing research and found his website and read the story, wrote to him, um, never expected to be involved to the <laughs> caliber that I am. How, how did you find his that. story? Uh, just from Google, just from Googling like Texas, and innocent on Texas death row. It came up pretty quickly. Okay. He wrote back it was the second website to um, Todd, Todd Willingham, who was executed, um, I think it was 2004. Was that right? 2004? Yeah, he was innocent as well, but he was executed for the crime that he was wow. convicted of. So Texas he still has a website, and it was, I found his after that. Uh, and Texas seems like they don't really play around. They're the one state that they Mm-mm. execute people probably more than the rest of the U.S. combined, I would I guess. Okay. Yeah, they are the highest. Since, yeah. since, um, since last year, Texas has executed 566 people. Um, since 1976, so they're the highest wow. um, state with the most execution. When you, when you think about that in comparison to the to the whole of the states, since the 1970s, the date that she just stated, uh, just over 1,500 people have been executed. So a third so, in so Texas. Texas wow. a, a third of Texas. Wow. Uh, how did you get involved, Tish, when you first came across Rob's story? Um, I saw Paradise Lost about the West Memphis Three um, when uh, many years ago, and being that kind of weirdo goth kid myself, I just I felt like somebody kicked me in the stomach when I saw it. It was like these kids are like they're, they're going to be executed because they're the weird kid, you know, mm. and that just blew my mind. And then I, when I started just to just to look into wrongful convictions and things like that, um, it just it just became apparent quite how large a problem this is. You know, the West of History aren't unusual. Once you start getting down the rabbit hole, you realise that there are just an unbelievable number of people that have been wrongfully convicted. You know, 172 people have been exonerated 
um, from American Death Row since the 70s. Now, if you look at that compared to the number I just gave you, 1,500, that's 11% of people. And, the, and the, the standard of proof is so high once you're already convicted to get off. I mean, yeah, an exoneration yeah. is almost impossible to get. So if we're thinking that only those people, only those people manage to meet that unbelievable standard, how many people are we killing? How many people, how many of those men? Because it's probably not 11%. It's probably an awful lot more. And that, I mean, you can hear my voice. I'm getting quite emotional when I talk about this because it upsets me. It upsets when, me. When that someone any... is exonerated, do they get any kind of reparations or it's just like, okay, you're out of jail? It depends Sometimes, on the state. Yeah, it depends on the state. It's. I feel like it's rare. It's more rare that they get compensation than they don't. Yeah. And then also, just because the, uh, we have an exoneration statistic, but a lot of the people who are let out aren't fully exonerated. Like right. Damien Eccles and them, they had to take an Alfred plea, which meant that they were admitting their guilt, but they were being, being let go because the state pretty much didn't want to take responsibility for them being wrongfully convicted. So I think a lot of the people, I think more people are let go that aren't exonerated, but are free than are yeah. exonerated. It's a high, it's high standard to be let out, but then it's a higher standard for the exoneration. Full exoneration, so, uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. You're like, uh, we're gonna take you off death row, but you still have a felony and you can't vote. You can't yeah. Do this, you can't do and that. guys that, you, you know, back, so. guys are desperate by that point. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you've been yeah. there 20 years, you've not seen your family, you've not got phone calls, you haven't even watched a movie in 20 years or felt somebody touch you, have a hug. At that point, if somebody said to me, you know, we're going to offer you this deal. You'll spend the rest of your life in jail and we know you're innocent, but we're not going to have murder hanging over your head and you may get to actually have a contact visit where you touch someone you love. My Lord, I would take that. Mm -hmm. I would right. take that. Right. And these guys do. Yeah. yeah. I always thought it was a weird system. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Rex. Oh, no, no, go for it. Just our, our judicial system of, you know, if someone's guilty, let's just say, let's just say like they know they're guilty and they usually the, the prosecutor's like, okay, if you plea, then we take you off of death row, right? Because it's like, we want to make this easier. So if you plea bargain, then we'll take you off of death row. We'll just give you life right. in prison. But if you're, if you're innocent and you're like, no, I'm going to fight for my case and you end up losing in trial, then you end up getting death row for the person who like really fought it because they fought for their innocence. Right. Whereas the person's like, no, I did this. I killed that person or whatever. I did this. And so I'm going to get a less case just because I'm going to save the taxpayer some money by just plea bargaining it out and calling right. it. Yeah, and, and some, is, people, sorry. some innocent people, they'll just take a plea before the trial to avoid the death penalty altogether, and they'll yeah. take life in prison for something they didn't do, and that that's just... Yeah, and then that's got to be hard, because then then if they try to appeal later, it probably comes back, and I'm like, hey, why did you admit guilt here? Right. In like, most states, you can't appeal if you've taken a plea. That's it. That's, that's, it. that's it. You're done. And you know, 97% of American cases are a plea deal. Only 3% go to trial. I mean, you've got so many innocent people that have pled guilty. No question. Yeah. Right. No question. So, uh, Trish, back to your story. Um, did at that point you start the freewill.org or, um, you know, after you, you, how did connect those dots for us? Um, no, there's somebody else was doing it then. Uh, you know, it, these days it's it's Jess, Jess, and, and and for many years actually now it's been just Jess, pretty much just Jess and I. But before that, there were other people, you know, that have done amazing work for Rob. This has not just been about us, but this is a really hard thing to do emotionally. It's extremely draining, and not everybody can ha can deal with it for that long, or their lives may not not just fit around being able to do it, it it's emotionally and, and for other reasons it's a very difficult work to do um so i joined an existing um free rob will movement who who um i slowly just basically did more and more and more and as people dropped off over time i took on more and more until the point where i was doing the website and doing other bits and pieces and then after quite a few years um then that's when Rob was like, she just needs some help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jess came along. Yep. Yeah. And she um, does so much. Like, the, the, I don't know how I would survive with she, without her around. She does 
so much for him and for the uh, movement and everything that it's just it's just phenomenal so then okay so then i say jess uh so then you wrote to rob and then did you get a letter back from him did you get a letter back from tish and then how did you then go said okay cool now i'm gonna join the team and help out in whatever capacity i can um, the first time I wrote to him, he did write back, but it wasn't really in the capacity of, can you help me? Um, I was in grad school at the time, um, taking my master's in publishing. So after I told him that, I think that he kind of mulled that over and um, eventually in 2015 asked me to help with just the Facebook page. But that's kind of expanded to all the social media and communications and stuff like that. So is one of the main uh, aspects of the free robwill.org is to just bring awareness to the situation to get yeah. eyes on Rob's case. Yeah, that's really the that is the main the main sort of goal at the moment. I mean, in the past it was it had been further things as we really needed good attorneys and things like that, but over the years due to, you know, other people helping in the past, you know, we've managed to get some good pro bono attorneys. Um, so we've got a pretty good team right now. Um, but look, from looking at, you know, how other people have been exon exonerated in the past and stuff, when people are executed and, and innocent people lose their cases, it happens because it's being done in the dark. You know, people really need to know what's happening. Uh, and so a lot sense. of it is, is, yeah. is awareness. You know, people need to know. And um, people need to get involved because... You know, politicians do care if their people are not happy with the situation. So it is important that people, people not just learn about Rob's case, but get involved. You know, on freerobworld.org, we've got a page called Help Us. And on that, it will explain different ways that you can help us from signing a petition to writing uh, to different officials, particularly for Texan. That's extremely helpful. We have form letters. So you can just edit a little bit if you don't know what to write, that kind of thing. All of that can be found on the website. Um, so, because we do understand that it is quite hard for people, you know, you look at something and it's this big and you're like, what do I do to help? How can I help? Um, so, go for it, Ben. I was going to set a question for Rob's um, initial murder case. Did he have a, a lawyer or did he just have a public defender that represented him? Yeah, he had a public defender that was very ineffective. Um, he... What's the details behind him? I forget. <laughs> I he actually had him. two. He had actually two uh, public defenders that worked on the case, and yeah. basically none of them really put in the work. As in a lot of public defenders, they don't get paid a lot. They're generally inexperienced. Mm -hmm. The work just wasn't put in. Witnesses weren't brought to trial that should have been. Investigations weren't done that should have been should have been done. Um, in their defence, as we know now, with the Brady violation, the prosecution was hiding evidence, mm -hmm. which is not their fault. You know, they, that, that had been subpoenaed. That, that's, that's not their fault at all. Um, but I feel that certainly Rob feels that those trial attorneys um, didn't, just didn't really put the work in. And that's not unusual with a public defender. I mean, mm -hmm. not, a lot of it comes down to money. I would also yep. guess, I mean, maybe it's because the climate we're in now, but the, the politics of it, when it's an officer who was shot, I would imagine that the state wants to get what they would call justice quick, you know, like, hey, we want to, mm -hmm. we just want to pin it on this guy. This is Rob. He did it. And we're going to make him pay, you know, and like, they yeah, just I mean, want to get that right. out there. You know, they don't, the, the last thing they probably, they don't want to have, oh, he's innocent. And now the person who shot this officer is at large and we don't know who it is or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. you know, they, want, they just want for the, to make the story all wrapped up and good for them is, hey, the police, we've got justice. Now it's this guy. You know, he's the one that the, mm -hmm. they don't have to fall on the sword. And the prosecutor did pretty much everything he could to um, get Rob convicted. He, they put an ad out in a police newsletter asking every police officer to come uniformed to the um, to the trial, and they called it the Wall of Blue because it was there intimidating the juries pretty much. Um, and that prosecutor was later had forced to resign because of some scandals that he was involved with. Uh, that's a whole different story, but yeah. <laughs> and, well, yeah, I mean, you guys, they could. 
They they even compared him to the this is this is trial happened right after nine eleven happened and they even compared him to the nine eleven terrorists to intimidate the jurors or so, oh, wow. yeah. yeah. Out of curiosity, <laughs> did the public defender even put the other kid, the the guy, the one who probably did it on the stand? No. Wow. He wasn't interrogated. There was nothing. There was no forensic. They questioned him. him. Not a trial. But they didn't put him yeah. on. Yeah, but gosh, like, what a, how could you, that just seems like, for that public They had figure, never that? had any intention of doing anything other than pinning it on someone that wasn't the cop's kid. Yeah. I mean, right. at the end of the day, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah they the never even fingerprinted him. Oh, really? That he was, he <laughs> was, they didn't even, I mean, I try, one of the things I try and do is when I'm speaking is, even though I know Rob, I'll try not to ever say anything. I don't have, the, re the the evidence for written down somewhere so I can provide it. Here's where that was said at trial. And you can see on the trial records that they never even submitted the co-defendant's DNA as a sample for comparison. They didn't even give it to them to compare it to the crime scene. I mean- it, they, Was the firearm uh, ever recovered? They, the firearm was recovered, yeah, yeah. But again, the other guy was never fingerprinted. Um, I, I, he was fingerprinted, but again, he they don't they didn't they took it, but none of it was submitted. So, but they didn't even take the DNA from. Uh, they didn't even take a DNA from him. They didn't submit it to the lab. So, effectively, oh, his shoe casings were never tested. So, nothing from the crime scene was compared to his stuff. Um, so, effectively, his DNA could have been. All over the, all over the, all over the deputy. Yeah, but right. they would never know. It's um, it's too bad. It just totally seems like, like you talked about, it was just, hey, we need to, we need to make this look good in the media and find the victim, and that victim happened to be Rob, and it's like we're just gonna push it through. You know, they didn't care yeah. about a, a case, you know, they didn't care about innocence. It was just, you know, we gotta, we gotta get closure for these cops and their families, and we're just gonna push this through and not try and, you know, actually give them a, a legitimate trial. Yeah, I think they knew. They knew. They knew the day that they arrested him, what they what their plan was gonna be when yeah, they had a cops and kid. Yeah, they knew what they were doing, and it happens well, all the also time. Also, the gunshot wound. Uh, I would imagine that uh, Rob had probably there was a, a lot of evidence in of that because like, like if you shoot yourself in the hand it's going to yeah. be a completely different style wound than if a bullet's coming from further away mm -hmm. they claim that he shot himself in the hand the one thing that always blows did. my mind is you always think you always hear about blood spatter and like criminal shows and all that mm -hmm. rob had no blood from the deputy on him i think what was it, like a drop on his shoe or something the, the deputy had a drop of rob's blood one drop on his shoe from where yeah, he was shot in the hand they the person... claim, sorry they claim that he shot him from such close range if he did that there would have been blood all over, all over but yeah. not just close because... range but they claim he stood over him over <laughs> him and shot with a bleeding hand with and with, uh, if you can see that we don't have the pictures on the website do we but it, he was not just showing that his entire knuckles were blown off. If you meet oh, Rob he's, today, he's still just got he's a massive dip. No, yeah. no knuckles. Right. I mean, we're in the photos from the crime scene. You can see it's an. You see all the open bone. There is no way you could stand over somebody and shoot repeatedly and not bleed all over them. We actually didn't talk really frustratingly. We, we didn't talk a lot about a lot of other evidence during the podcast. I mean, the other thing the prosecution said. Um, was um, uh, was sorry. It's not the other thing they said. So he stood. They said that he stood over him and shot from above at close range. But their own ballistics experts say that it was shot from behind, from the left, mm -hmm. and long range. Yeah, I was going to even in their own chart, they state that that was the case. Mm -hmm. Rob was not to the left, long range, and behind. He was handcuffed and in front of the officer. And this was in two thousand. This is in 2000, yeah. I'm just trying to think back of like, you know, the technology we had back then compared to now. It's always tough to... Well, they had DNA testing of back then in like the late, probably in all of the 90s and then early 2000s, there was a surge of wrongful convictions. Like the, the Central Park Five yeah. was right around then. 
Damien Eccles and West Memphis Three was in 92, I think. Um, so it, that whole area, that whole time in our in our country was, there was a lot of this going on. Yeah, I so Rob's you, definitely not isolated in that. You look at the whole thing, it's just so crazy. You look at, you know, the fact that his co-defendant, I don't know if we say his name or can't say his name, but anyways, the co-defendant whose dad is a police officer goes to the house, has his clothes washed, bleached, um, confesses to Rob, to Rob, right? Or to a, a mutual friend. No, to the three people that were at the house. Rob has, Rob's run away. Oh, he already took <laughs> off. At this point, yeah. yeah, he's afraid and he's run. So yeah. he's gone back to, to the place and there were three people there. And I think, yeah, then you look at the fact that the, the public defender doesn't even put him on the stand, doesn't bring in the evidence of his fingerprints, doesn't bring in any of these forensic evidence, um, just kind of lets it wash on a table. To me, I, it, again, I, I feel like a broken record. I feel like they just, they just wanted to get a, to get a guilty verdict on somebody. Just, yeah, I mean, just not to hide the evidence that he ha tried to have Rob murdered. Yeah. Now, why why do you have want to have somebody murdered in that situation? You want to do it because you don't want them to talk. Yeah. There's no then, other reason. And when you add in that, you know, he was at the scene and they don't even get his fingerprints. They don't, or like, don't even submit it at all. It's just, yeah, it's uh, it's frustrating, you know, because even let's say like obviously everything continues to go good and Rob gets. Um, vindicated and released it's still been you know 20 plus years yeah. of life that he's had to spend yeah. in solitary confinement i mean right now we're looking at like because of covid we talk about people who are dealing with depression and mental health issues for being isolated for you know seven months think of right. like 20 years in a jail you know and mm -hmm. what that what that does to you. and those years as well those particular set of years you know i'm about the same age as rob you know i'm in, in my early 40s that 20 to 40, man. That's that's, your that's where you prime. become an adult. That's your prime. Yeah. That's where you have kids. That's where you find what you want to do in life. That's where you have just, that's, that's it. That's yeah. such an important period of time to lose. Um, talk about uh, the latest uh, happenings in the case. I know we kind of touched on uh, the Brady claim. Um, so can you kind of just explain what that is and kind of tell us why it's so significant. Um, well, let, let me give you a small overview just basically of where we are with okay, the great. trial. So um, after, after, um, after the trial, then Rob was given basically just as many ineffective appeal lawyers um, as he was given uh, trial lawyers. Um, his first direct appeal, the, um, sorry, the lawyer pub, uh, filed his appeal before the trial transcript had even been released. She wasn't at trial. The, the transcript hadn't been typed and released, but she had already filed the appeal by the time that had even re been released. So obviously that appeal was not going to have anything in there that was going to get him off. Then after that comes the state habeas. Uh, for his state habeas appeal, Rob was appointed a lawyer who had Parkinson's at the time, um, so was suffering from all of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, he didn't raise any issues of Rob's innocence. In fact, he didn't even name Rob within, within the appeal. It was 26 pages long, when normally a habeas would be hundreds of pages long. And in fact, when looked into it, it was a copy and paste of a serial killer's appeal he had filed years earlier. Even the typos, even the typos in oh the appeal gosh. were still in it when he filed it for Rob. So obviously then that failed. I can't believe he would even copy and paste in, in that, that little amount of uh, effort to try and free him. 26 pages, you know. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a law student and my essays are longer than 26 <laughs> yeah. pages, you know. Yeah, like, come on, buddy. Just at least yeah, like, just, make an effort like just you're trying. A, just try a little, little bit. Yeah, I mean, in the guy's defense, he had Parkinson's. Yeah. But what should happen in that point is that he should recuse himself. Right. He should not be working on that case anymore. And if he didn't know, which, you know, maybe what was the case, he wasn't aware, he wasn't doing, doing the, the correct work. But then Rob should get another shot at that appeal, you yeah. know? Um, 
And that appeal is pretty much the reason how we are where we are now, um, because he, since he submitted his first habeas appeal under the uh, 1996 Anti-Death Penalty and Terrorist Act, he wasn't allowed to submit another one. Oh, really? So he's pretty much been fighting this whole time for right. another chance, which is where we are now with the August um, decision. So yeah, how was he able to get that through then? Um, Basically, uh, the stand, sorry, yeah. go ahead. So the, you can go ahead. You understand law stuff more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, so EDPA, the, the act that she was just discussing was, was um, a, an act brought about um, basically in the wake of the Oklahoma bombing to make sure that people could be executed quickly because cases were going very slowly through the courts. New mm -hmm. evidence would come along and they would get habeas after habeas after habeas, new evidence and some another, and it would, was dragging things out. And, and the, the general atmosphere at the time after the bombing, of course, was that people wanted things done quick. Right. Um, so that limited the fact that people, that the inmates could have one habeas, one federal habeas, um, uh, and nothing more unless an extremely high standard was met and that um, it had been approved by a higher court, um, depending on which state that would be. Um, so um, Rob basically had to take it to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit are extremely, extremely conservative. Um, in fact, the... the um, the judges that just ruled on his were all Trump appointees, which is an interesting one. So, you know, you can imagine how the level of conservative judges we're dealing with. Um, so basically he had to, to, to have another shot at his uh, federal habeas. He needed to prove um, this very high standard, basically. Uh, we were very nervous because the court is, uh, is so conservative, so strict. Um, but but they felt that the Brady Brady claims were a high enough standard for him to be able to have an application for another habeas appeal. So what is the Brady claims? Uh, the Brady claims are, as we discussed earlier, so the prosecution um, did not um, hand over all of the uh, documents that they were supposed to during discovery. And that was two items. One, that the co-defendant had made incriminating statements to a jail officer um, stating that he was involved with the murder and the second was the paperwork showing that the co-defendant had to be put into segregation as he had tried to hire someone to have Rob murdered. Gotcha. Um, so at this point with that evidence when would the next appeal be transacting um we aren't exactly sure they just released the scheduling order last month so i think they'll probably have to have some extensions and things so it'll go it'll definitely go into next year for sure the initial filing is set out so the initial application uh to the amended tape oh. would go in in december but then what would normally happen is that they normally, like Jess said, we know the experience, they will ask for extensions. They may ask for oral arguments. They may ask for an evidentiary hearing. Um, but as Jess said, she's, she's completely correct. It's going to be probably summer next year before we mm -hmm. really know anything at all. Yeah, I wouldn't be Very surprised strong. if it went into two, three years from now that wow. we're still fighting it. And this thing's been forever. How is Rob's, like, mental state during all this does he stay really calm i mean obviously he can only do so much like do you do you sense like extra anxiety like when it gets approved and excitement or has he just been kind of like mellow yeah let's talk a little bit about rob yeah he was shocked i think to say he the was, least he was excited yeah. yeah the last time when i visited him in january um he was completely confident that he nothing was going to come from this nothing positive was, would come from this so he was completely convinced that it would be denied so when we sent him the information about it being granted he was just over, he I, I don't even know the word to explain yeah. <laughs> how surprised he was because if nothing i mean like, blown away. this at least like was did he ha already have like an execution date set then now obviously no. it would be pushed back so he'd never had anything set he's never had an execution date set once this whole time 
which is very telling because a lot of these guys have multiple ones before they are executed. Like, um, I think Robert Pruitt was executed three years ago this month, and he was innocent as well. He had, like, five to seven dates before they did it, and Rob's innocence claims are so strong that he's not even gotten to that point yet. Has, uh, what has Rob done while uh, incarcerated to, uh, you know, continue moving forward through all this? I would imagine, like you said, like, he's got to at some point probably be like, oh, I'm going to be in here for the rest of my life. Um, I mean, how does someone, is he doing other things to, you know, keep his mind active, to continue to try to stay positive? What are some of the things that he's told you that he's doing while incarcerated? Um, so he has become a self-proclaimed artist while being in there. That's his main go-to um, to stay you know, grounded and everything we've done. He has a huge, huge collection, probably over 70 pieces at this point. Uh, we've done art shows. Before I was involved, there was one in Germany, Tish did one in England, and then we did a couple in New York City last year. Okay. With hopes of, we had another one earlier this year, right before um, COVID started. But yeah, so that's a big thing for him. Um, he's also become a yoga instructor while being in there. He's um, been certified in paralegal legal assistance through a correspondence program. He's become a writer, poet. Um, he was part of a drive, movement called Drive. It was a kind of a protest from inside the prison to help with um, the conditions in there and to not like a inactive or like an active protest, but it wasn't any kind of like it was like a silent nonviolent. Like, yeah, right, nonviolent, right. Like, yeah, protests inside the prison kind of um, just to try to make the conditions in there better because Texas death row conditions are the worst in the country. Hmm. So, I mean, that in and of itself to me kind of speaks volumes of his character that he's doing all of these things proactively, mm -hmm. improving as a person. I mean, you're and in he's, an opportunity yeah, right even, now to to either grow or to decline and he's choosing to grow. Yeah. And he's not even just improves himself, but he's taken it upon himself to teach people, teach other guys things in there. Like a lot of the people in there, there was one guy, Alfred Dwayne Brown. He was let go a couple years back because he was innocent as well. He was also prosecuted by the same person as Rob was. And they also hit evidence in his case. Um, and he, when he got to death row, he couldn't even read and Rob taught him how to read. Oh, wow. Oh, um, he's amazing. taught people art, um, yoga. So he... And he teaches to... our stuff, too. Like, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he likes to help people. Yeah. Like, he really does. This. It's really part of his nature, is that he wants to make the world a better place. And when he talks about... Um, when he talks about what he wants to do when he gets out, there is no... You know, I, I don't know, I want to go to a bar or I want to have kids or I want to do any of that. It's all what I can do to to work within the world to do to make it a better place, you know. Mm -hmm. If you go to actually directs to um, the website freerobwill.org, you can click on Rob's art and have there for a bunch yeah, of Yeah, I, uh, I, I got to see really, some of his art. Yeah, yeah. Dude, some of it's really cool. You yeah. can definitely see some stuff is like, I'm sure inspired by a lot of the reading that he's doing and some stuff is inspired by things he sees in prison. You see some like these hands with like tattoos on it. That makes me think of like, you know, something inspired more by prison and then other ones that you can definitely tell are probably inspired by books that he's read while he's been in there. Mm -hmm. And he reads. <laughs> <Trust> <laughs> I have hundreds of his books in my attic. <laughs> yeah. Every time I go to visit, he releases more, and he has a huge, huge collection. He doesn't want to get rid of any of them. He wants to keep. That's his only possession, really. Yeah. So yeah. he doesn't want to get rid of them. He's always reading a lot of fiction books, but he reads about every subject you could possibly think of. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, he's probably. I know a lot of intelligent people, and he's without question one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. There are times I don't struggle to follow conversations, but there are times when I visited where I'm like, what did you just say? Like, slow, <laughs> let me repeat that just so I can comprehend some of his ideas. You know, he's mm -hmm. such an intelligent man. Yeah. 
So Tish, I had a question for you as far as, you know, being in England and are the laws, like, was, is it difficult trying to learn everything law-wise in the U.S. also with Rob's case or do a lot of stuff uh, translate between, between English law, you know, English law and U.S. law? What's actually been really difficult for me is that I started with Rob several years before I decided to study law in the UK. Oh, so I learned American law uh -huh. before I uh, learned the UK law. And so now I'm having to unlearn American law yeah. and learn UK law. There is some crossover. We, they, they, we both have a common law system that, that all comes out of the same, the same thing. It's still precedent, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it works similarly, very different from the rest of Europe, which doesn't work that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes it gets confusing when I'm studying this and I'll say, I've said in class before, that's a Brady violation. Like, <laughs> like, no, what's it's Brady? Not. no, it's not. That's not. It's, it's not. <laughs> but it, I mean, the, the big difference here is, is we don't kill people. Mm. We don't execute people. Um, and we don't tend to have the kind of sentencing that you have. Um, so we don't have sentencing, you know, we don't, we don't put 14 year olds in prison for the rest of their lives. So that's a big difference. Um, and yeah, it's also, you that's guys the main probably reason. don't have nearly as many incarcerations either. I would yeah. think. Oh, no, it's not, not even close. I mean, you've got 25% of the entire incarcerated population of the planet in yeah. your jails. And that's really the reason why you'll find me working in this and not volunteering with cases in the UK. Yeah, the US prison system is all, it's so messed up from the, so many aspects of it. You know, I always thought of like, the, you know, there's very little emphasis ever on rehabilitation. It's, it seems like it's, it's just a, you know, we could talk probably a whole podcast on the problems of the American yeah. jail system. There's so many. Yeah, so at this point, if people are listening and they're moved by the story and they want to help out with Rob, what, but you kind of had mentioned some form letters and I mean, are, is there funds that people can contribute uh, to help with the lawyer fees or what are the different ways people can get involved? Most of our fundraising these days is more for campaigning fees because, because we've, we've been very lucky to have uh, some pro bono help as well as is his appointed lawyer. Uh, we do fundraise and that's because it, it's, it's massively surprising how much everything just costs and every single thing that we do is paid for out the pocket of myself or Jess, mm -hmm. you know, so even just down to the smallest things of, you know, when Rob needs, needs things like he needs books constantly. He needs books because he doesn't have a TV. He doesn't have a phone. And since COVID he's not allowed visits either. So, you know, running the website, so traveling to and from for things that we've had to do, all of that, you know, I've, I've probably spent $20,000 on traveling, just, just traveling. That doesn't include so anything else. He's not allowed visits in COVID, but isn't there a, a glass in between? Uh, exactly. So just no one's allowed in the prison, is that what it I is? I think that they just are trying to keep visitors out because ah. the, the guards are, but the guards still bring it in anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference. They can yeah. still has temperatures and yeah. everything. They just want to give a reason not to let them have visits because they all, they already they only get two hours a week. Um, for us, since we travel for, from further away, well, he get he would get one special visit. It's called a month, which is four hours, two days in a row. So if he got a special visit and then a regular visit, he would get eight hours for the special and then two hours for the week that the special wasn't happening. So they already limit the visitation so much. So they're just, I really just think they're just trying to give a reason not to let them have visits. And is it all uh, of the prisoners don't get TV or is he in a situation where he's not allowed to get TV? No death row. They only can have radio, no uh, magazines and books that are approved. There's a big list of books that are banned that they're not allowed to have. Really? Um, what books are, I wonder what books they, I'm sure you don't have a whole list, but that seems interesting. Random things sometimes. Yeah. random i've sent him a vampire book denied denied <laughs> denied because it was on their list as detrimental to the offender's rehabilitation oh. a he's on death row b it's a vampire story it's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. but it was on I the got, band list wow 
I've gotten denied books. He gets art books a lot because he lo- he's obviously a huge artist. Um, and if any of the art has anyone naked in the art, they will get denied. He'll get denied. Oh, yeah, he's not a real person. Yeah, he's not a real person. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So he's allowed the book, books, magazines. They all have to be sent from like Amazon or Hamilton book. We can't send them like from our house. It has to be sent from the distributor. And, he and really then he them. has a radio he listens to? Yeah, he has a radio. He listens to a bunch of different um, uh, shows on the radio. He listens to um, NPR and D- Democracy Now. And I mean, I, one thing I just don't know if we've mentioned, and I think we may have just skipped over it, but forgive me if I'm wrong, is that Texas Death Row is kept entirely in solitary confinement. Oh, mm-hmm. So when I say no visits, you know, that's so impactful. He, he never, he gets out of his, shelter, out of his cell to shower and to go outside to a larger cage by himself. Mm-hmm. Wow. Even his outside time is solitary. Confined, solitary. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unless he wants to shout to guys that pass. And his cell, like, think of, like, a parking lot, a parking spot you park your car in, but all four corners of it are, the, the walls are up. And there's no window. There's a little slit of a window that he could possibly look out if he stood on his tippy toes on top of the bed, which just shows the prison anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, they get fed the through toilet a and sink the one thing and, they get yeah, fed through a slot in the door like a dog like it's just yeah wow. it's the yeah. worst possible so inhumane think of. and it's almost 20 years that he's been incarcerated at this point he is on It'll, December 4th mm-hmm. wow wow well I you know hats off to you ladies for for really uh champion his cause because uh like you said earlier you know there's a lot of innocent people that are incarcerated and um you know for you guys to really help uh someone like this you know shows a lot about you two and um you know can kind of teach us all that uh just because someone is incarcerated doesn't mean that they're guilty yeah Mm -hmm. I really would encourage people to get involved as well if they can because it it's not just about helping helping people but it can really change your perspective on on for gratitude for a start right. to remind yourself every day what you have every day what we take for granted when I walk my dogs that freedom just just every day I mean it can, it's so it's very impactful to know somebody who's going through this this kind of thing and you know it does help people but also i think it's i think it's good for people yeah Yeah, definitely being involved with this has changed my life in ways that i don't even think i can comprehend after being involved like i'm a a different person from just just what tish just said so i mean i know that it's a very uncomfortable thing for people to get involved with but you grow in discomfort so that, that's what I would say to people who are yeah, considering helping someone. Yeah, that's good. So, I mean, I think for anyone who's listening to the, the podcast now or watching this on YouTube, you know, go to freerobwill.org, learn more about his case and help out in any way that you can. I mean, one of the simplest, easiest ways to help out, just like I think Tish mentioned earlier, is share his story on your social media platform, share it with your friends, mm-hmm. because just like you said, those, you know, these executions tend to happen in the dark when there's not um when people don't know about the case so the more advocates out there just talking about the case talking about rob's story is going to help him out it's also going to help out other people who are innocent on death row or maybe innocent on a life sentence that are going through appeals so um that doesn't take much just takes a little education and then just sharing it with people that you know and then obviously the next steps you can go to freerobwill.org you guys have a contact i i imagine on here on the home page I was going to say that actually is is people new people will always bring something we've not thought of before. So do, you know it's it's great if people can reach out and just be like you know I know this person or I thought of this have you thought of this? Um, do feel free to drop us an email because we're always we're always open to hearing from people. Okay, and yeah, also yeah. our social media is at, at Free Rob Will on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and I always respond to messages on those pretty quickly. 
So if they want to send on that, follow us on there. We're pretty active on social media. So if they and that's follow, uh, probably also a good spot to follow along with, you know, where things are going with this case, mm-hmm. you know, I would imagine. Yeah, we post yep. almost daily. Um, we post mostly about Rob. Sometimes we will trickle in some just education about the system because I think that's also important because it yeah. affects Rob's case as well as so many others. So we really try to be kind of uh, universal with what we share on there. Awesome. Well, Tish, Jess, thank you guys so much yeah. for sharing the story. Um, we'd love to be able to circle back sometime, keep in touch, especially if there's any new information that happens to come out or any new uh, revelations with the case that you guys would uh, want to share. We will listeners. add you to our mailing list. Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>